Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage founder and conference chair of Black Hat, Jeff Moss. <laughs> Hey. So this is a this is a lot of people for a, a day two beginning. How many of you didn't go out last night? <laughs> I think there's one person over there. Someone get that person a shot. Get them. <laughs> They're in need of Corona right now. It's an emergency deployment. Um, so normally what I kind of do is I like to talk about who's here. Like, who are all these people sitting in these seats? Where are they coming from? And uh, so we, you might have heard, we have a new uh, registration company this year. <laughs> and um, so, uh, so I just got handed a report about who's actually here from which country. So I'll just go through that really quickly. Um, did you know we have one person from Guatemala? One person... <laughs> And so I'm always curious when you get to so some countries with one, it's like, are they just messing around with the registration form, or are they really here? Um, somebody from, one person from Hungary, one person from the Republic of Korea, one person from Malaysia, and one from the Netherlands, Antilles. And if you know where that is, I'll buy you a drink. <laughs> um, and some of the standout surprises, okay, 10, 10 from Russia, that's pretty good. We got over... Uh, 23 from China. That's a pretty big showing uh, for them to come all this way. And of course, by far, United States, of course. Um, one from Vietnam, one from Wales, one from Turkey, one from Thailand. And, uh, and I think we got a really good uh, representation. Okay, and if you can tell me the difference between Slovakia and Slovenia. There's one each, and they're going to have a death match later. <laughs> and we're all invited to watch. So uh, I think that's amazing, and, and Black Hat uh, always draws a pretty inter interesting international crowd. Um, and so it's no surprise, but it just, it always is really cool to see how far people travel, how passionate they are for this stuff. So that's about all I have to say this morning, except I want to thank everybody for making it a great show, and I'm going to get right into the keynote. Um, and so we're going to have a new format for this morning, for this day two. It's going to be more conversational. Uh, between Brian Krebs and Neil Stevenson, and both people need no introduction. Um, they're so well-known icons uh, in the industry. Uh, and Brian Krebs, um, an independent investigative uh, journalist who has been doing some surprisingly uh, detailed work looking into what I like about it when he looks toward the economics of uh, cybercrime and uh, crimeware and criminal organizations. but. Reporting on that stuff is not without risk, and, uh, and currently his uh, KrebsOnSecurity.com is under both a DDoS and a DNS attack, so you probably can't get to his site right now. But um, that's the price of doing business and trying to shed some light on uh, the bad actors. So they don't always cooperate uh, <laughs> when you reveal what they're up to. And, uh, and Neil Stevenson, um, you know, of course, everybody knows him from his seminal work, uh, Snow Crash, which really kind of reinvigorated, in my mind, the genre of cyberpunk, which kind of had gotten calcified. Um, and I also, that's where I learned the word meme. And I remember when I was reading the chapter, he started using the word meme. It took me a while. I sat back and I had to think about memes for a while. And uh, so I still blame you for that memeing me. Um, and then I read a book called Interface, and I didn't realize it was written by him under a different name. And uh, he wrote it with his uncle. And it's completely applicable today as it was, you know, how many of years ago it was written about uh, an election and about how everybody was micro... Uh, they were sampling people, and they had a technology for one person who became one of the main characters, where they'd get instantaneous crowd feedback, and there'd be sort of like super pollsters on the side that would could somehow induce or bias the person who's speaking, sort of stimulate the pleasure center or the not pleasure center, so they can adjust the way they're speaking based on live, real-time feedback from the audience. And uh, that sounded really creepy, like 10 years ago. And it's still really creepy. And it's actually, we've moved closer to that, I think, with the rate, now we have uh, both presidential campaigns spending millions of dollars on, uh, what do they call it, crowd, um, sentiment analysis, 
algorithms to figure out what's the sentiment of their target audiences and how thinly can they slice their pools. So a lot of his work has, uh, has been really applicable to me and <clears throat> I really like some of the directions he's gone. So from sword fighting to his work with uh, Blue Origin at looking at the stars, um, I want to introduce both Brian Krebs and Neil Stevenson. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. That's actually my seat. Thanks, Brian. So, when the Black Hat folks asked me, uh, initially approached me about the idea of doing this interview, uh, I pretty much jumped at the chance. Uh, part of it is I'm a huge fan of this man and his work, uh, but also, you know, it's not every day that you get the opportunity to interview as accomplished and prolific, prolific an, an author as Neil. Um, so thank you, Neil, for being here. Glad to be here. And Thanks. Score for the Black Hat folks for scoring this interview. Um, it's hard to think of an, another author who might be more well-read by the, the security community and the tech community at large. Uh, but for the handful of you folks in the audience who may not be as familiar with Neil's work, uh, he's probably best known for his breakout thrillers, and I would say very prescient thrillers, um, Cryptonomicon and Snow Crash. He's the author of 11 other novels, and you know he's also just an amazingly well-rounded geek. And, and, and <laughs> I use that term as affectionately <laughs> and complimentary as possible, Neil. Yeah. Um, he's involved in all kinds of uh, extra literary pursuits. I know you hate that word, I'm sorry. Uh, from, from rocketry to swordplay and video game design, and uh, helping to incubate an endeavor that's been described uh, as, and I, and I love this phrase, moonshot ecosystem. Uh, so I'm going to talk about all of these things, but first I want to ask you uh, uh, about your new book. Uh, it's called RIMD. Uh, and for those of you who haven't had the pleasure yet, uh, it has a lot to recommend to this audience. It's, uh, and then there's no way I'm going to do the book justice in the 20 second soundbite here, but essentially the, the backdrop of this book is, uh, is like a World of Warcraft type video game called T-Rain. And the catalyst is a piece of malicious software unleashed by some Chinese hackers. And the software goes around stealing money from the game players and so on. And that sets up this whole sort of international series of incidents and, you know, real life battles. Anyway, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this book and I'm wondering if you could just tell me where the idea came from. Well, the, uh, uh, when, I was, when I was a kid, I used to read uh, thrillers by uh, a guy named Alistair MacLean who, um, wrote Where Eagles Dare and uh, a, a number of other uh, uh, great thrillers. And uh, I, 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 I still have kind of fond memories of reading those books. And, and, and from that time onward, I've, I've wanted to write <clears throat> a, uh, a, a thriller, but the, um, the landscape has changed quite a bit. And so you, you sort of can't get away with a lot of the, the old tropes that, that people used to use. Uh, everyone's got cell phones, everyone's got Google. So any okay. Uh, any thriller plot uh, device that relies on people being sort of out of touch or not being able to get some crucial piece of information um, or being able to sort of blend anonymously into a crowd doesn't really work anymore. So uh, we're so addicted to these things now. Yeah, yeah. So I was I was trying to uh, think of a way to uh, to 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 write a, a thriller that would sort of not have most of those uh, elements, but but still be fun to read. Um, and I had had this idea a long time ago of um, uh, back when uh, there was a, a, a well-known uh, uh, worm that was created by a kid in the Philippines. Uh, I can't remember the, the, the name of the, the guy who did it, but for, for a while it was a, it was a big story. You're talking about the I Love You virus? Or yeah, yeah, spread all around the world very rapidly. And I thought, well, what if uh, a, a, a a bug like that uh, managed to um, actually seriously inconvenience someone who got seriously pissed off at, at, at the, the, that person and tried to track them down. And that's kind of the, the kernel of the, the story of Reemd. Uh, I noticed in Reemd there were a couple of occasions where, you know, I, I was 
reading, listening to the book, actually, I listened to it on, on audio, uh, and that was fantastic. Uh, I was smiling at a couple of places uh, because it's, it, I could see you almost having fun with a couple of the characters. So the book is divided into two parts. In the first part, uh, there are these two guys, they're both authors, and their job is to sort of come up with the backstory and the, the, the stuff that makes the games interesting to the players. And one of the guys is just kind of a kind of a normal sort of academic guy, and the other guy's this uh, I don't know how you'd describe him. Probably the the closest thing is the, the Simpsons character, the comic book guy, you know. <laughs> um, and I I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but I'm curious: Do you ever write yourself into your own novels? In in in, in that case, both of the both of the writers you're talking about are essentially self-parody. Uh, they're they're kind of like the uh, angel and the devil uh, that are sitting on my shoulder uh, the, the, throughout my whole whole career. Uh, the only thing they have in common is that they write a hell of a lot, um, but uh, one of them is just sort of nakedly commercial, uh, and and the other one is sort of ultra stuffy uh, Cambridge Oxford uh, kind of uh, intellectual. So uh, Jekyll and Hyde, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, in Rindy, you've got this, uh, this other character, which I, I really kind of liked, although I, I probably wasn't supposed to. He's this crazy, rogue, Russian mobster guy, and he's kind of blazing a path of death and destruction throughout the book. He's chasing down the, the uh, Russian, uh, excuse me, the Chinese hackers that unleashed the virus that cost him a lot of money. And, you know, I have to confess, I sort of identify with this guy a little bit. I mean, <laughs> I'm... I'm, uh, you know, I, I'm sure like everyone else here, you know, is like the tech support guy for their entire family and neighborhood, you know, and, I, and I'm thinking, you know, was this at all cathartic for you? I mean, I'm just, I'm, th I'm picturing some lost manuscript somewhere as the due to, due to, maybe you don't even use Windows, I don't know. You're talking about Sokolov? The, or, or... Uh, no, the, the Ivanov. Oh, okay, yeah, well, no, he, he, um... Uh, he's, yeah, he's the, 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 the catalyst. He's the, 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 the guy who gets, uh, who, whose uh, finances get personally damaged by, by this, this, this uh, worm and, and kind of uh, touches off all the other, uh, all the other activity. But, but yeah, we've all been that person, right? We've all, we've all lost some of our data uh, to a, a bug or, or malware. And, and sort of, uh, we all just have to suck it up, right? There's nothing we can do. There's some uh, programmer or malware writer, writer somewhere in the world who's responsible for it, but we don't know who that person is. We can't find them, and even if we, we could, we, there's nothing we could really do about it. He's a guy who's got the resources to do what we all want to do, which is to, to track that SOB down and make right. a... Put a bullet in his head, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so do you, are you a Windows user, Mac user? Uh, I, I have predominantly been using Mac for the last several years, basically since OS X came out. I, re I read somewhere that you penned entire books in a quill and ink. Is that right? Uh, not a quill. Um, uh, a fountain pen. Um, I, uh, I actually thought about trying the quill thing, um, but it's... Uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of logistics involved. You've got to be blotting, and you, you've, you've got to uh, actually... Uh, you, you go through a lot of feathers. Uh, <laughs> kind of, it's kind of a messy, uh, a messy prop. P people, people who used to write that way, used to write a lot, would, uh, in a way it was kind of cool, but their writing environments were really kind of earthy, messy, like, almost like butcher shops, because they're constantly taking feathers and sort of stripping off the, the, the feathery stuff and, and cutting them up and dipping them in ink and uh, so there would be kind of a bird debris scattered all over their uh, their work environment. It's not, kind of cool, but um, I didn't want to go quite that far. So, all right, so moving along from the uh, feathers, uh, gaming is obviously a big part of this book, and the impetus behind uh, another project that, that I'll ask about in a second, but first I understand you're, you're a bit of a, uh, a gamer. How bad is the habit exactly uh, it's not too bad it's kind of medium bad um, the uh, what I found uh, was that um, I would be playing uh, first-person shooters on my Xbox and I would you know sort of come to and realize it was three o'clock in the morning and I'd been playing for eight hours or something and 
And so that was kind of not compatible with, uh, with my, my continued productivity as a writer. <laughs> so I had to do something about that. And then uh, I was also sort of aware at some level that I was supposed to be getting aerobic exercise. And when I was doing that, I um, had the opposite problem, which was that I'd get on the treadmill or the elliptical trainer, and I would say, okay, I've been doing this for two hours now. And I would look at the little timer, and it would be more like two minutes. <laughs> it was just you know, agonizingly slow passage of time. So I thought, well, maybe there's a way to kind of solve both problems at once. So I set up a Xbox and a, a TV right in front of my elliptical trainer. That's awesome. And started, and I found that I was actually able to, by balancing the control pad on the, the, the grab yokes of the, the trainer, I was able to, um, to play video games and, and use that thing at the same time. And, um, um, and, and it, it, it works. I mean, time goes by really fast, and I'm not, uh, I'm not sort of uh, suffering the full agony of, of spending, you know, 45 minutes or whatever on this stupid machine. <laughs> so what are, you, what are you playing when you're most, most often? Uh, it's, it's not going to be super interesting to people, but I tend to play a lot of the Halo universe nice. games. Um, it's just, nice. You know, uh, it's, those are just the most... Uh, I, be, because of the way I'm using these games, uh, anything that involves a lot of, sort of uh, consulting the internet, you know, for hints or any of that stuff, uh, isn't really that that workable for me. Uh, I couldn't help when I was reading ReamD detecting a little bit of uh, disdain on your part uh, for social networks like Facebook and Twitter. Are you a, a social network guy? Are you on these networks? Do you? Um, I, I, I've got both a public and a private Facebook page. I've got a Twitter account, which uh, I only actually started using a few months ago. Um, the, I ignored them for a long time until um, uh, it was brought to my attention that I had a Facebook page with 10,000 followers that I knew nothing about. Um, and, and so at that point, uh, it seemed wise to... Uh, to, to begin doing something with it. So, so now that's all kind of being managed. Um, the uh, uh, Twitter, I'm a little slower to warm up to just because uh, I mean, maybe it's the people I'm following, but I think everyone's cheating with Twitter. I think, I think that on Twitter, you shouldn't be allowed to embed links. And that would get rid of about 99% of the, the traffic on, on Twitter, my dream of Twitter was going to be that it would be all these pithy little haiku-like, uh, you know, <laughs> utterances. And you do get a few of those, but um, most of them it's just people embedding a link, and and so then you're off to some other website that could be arbitrarily verbose and and time-consuming. Uh, so it doesn't actually kind of save time or compress uh, bandwidth at all. So you're novel uh, Cryptonomicon and I guess Quicksilver focused quite a bit on uh, cryptography. What, uh, what exactly made this such a, an area of fascination for you? Well, I had been <clears throat> a, a little code geek since I was a kid and in fact the dust cover of the uh, first hardcover Cryptonomicon has got a picture of me from when I was about 10 years old reading uh, a, a book about codes. Um, so I was one of those kids, you know, I would like make the invisible ink out of the lemon juice and all the other, all the other uh, things that you learn in those books. So, um, and you know, I, I had then followed the story of, uh, of uh, the, <clears throat> the Enigma, uh, the code breaking facility at Bletchley Park and so on. And, um, and then um, when in the, uh, uh, I guess it would have been the, the 90s, I, I sort of became acquainted with uh, a, a few of the people who were sort of in the, the whole cypherpunk world. So um, rolling all those things together, I thought, well, um, you know, maybe there's a way to, uh, to actually make code breakers the, uh, the, the heroes of a, of a book, since they, they actually were heroes in, in World War II. And, um, and to try to take the inherent kind of thriller qualities of, uh, 
of what they do and, and make them into a, a, a fun story. And the, the kind of, um, the, the break that, that sort of made it all work was, was reading about this uh, effort that, that was made, and this is a real thing that happened, where um, uh, there, there was a, a, a possible uh, leak of, uh, of the fact that the enigma had been broken um, in, in that the, uh, the Allies acted upon some, uh, some enigma information that they probably shouldn't have and, and in a manner that would have um, uh, aroused the suspicions of the, the Germans that, that maybe their channels of communication had been broken somehow. And so they had to solve the problem by uh, throwing a dead German in a wetsuit out of a plane um, and, and having him wash up uh, on a beach somewhere. Um, and and they, they planted some, some stuff on his body that sort of told a story that explained this, uh, this leak. Um, so that was where I got the idea that well, maybe there was a, a whole like super ultra top secret unit of, of commando types whose sole purpose was to do things like that but even they wouldn't know why they were, were doing it. So it would just seem like this incredibly heinous, inexplicable series of assignments uh, that, that would make no sense whatsoever. And that is the, the, that's how Cryptonomicon got, got started. Uh, some of your books, including uh, Cryptonomicon, just they reek of having you done massive amounts of research. I mean, how much time do you spend on the research side versus the writing side. I'm just very curious about that. Well, I'm, I'm almost a little ashamed to call it research because it's not compared to what real researchers do. It's, it's this incredibly pragmatic, sleazy kind of uh, cherry picking process of, you know, skimming through a book and, and oh, I could use that. You know, I could use that uh, if I change everything. Um, <laughs> And uh, there's no like footnotes. There's no you know legitimate scholarship uh, going on. Um, so uh, uh, it's just something that that uh, I think it's a skill that one one develops in writing this kind of fiction to kind of do enough, but not too much. My 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 tendency, my weakness is to do too much and then uh, try to. Uh, the, the the problem with doing too much is that. Once you've done it, you, you want to find some way to cram it into the, the book. And the books are already kind of huge and, and with lots of digressions and so on. And, and, and so that, that's an impulse that really has to be kept under, under control. So the impulse to use everything because you really like it and yeah. even though if it may not fit. Yeah, like in, in, in Ream D, uh, there was a page that stayed in there for a long time where um, it's a, just like a one-page description of, of people in Fujian making tea, how they make tea. They make tea in a kind of different way uh, from, from most other people. And um, it, uh, it was a nice little description. I knew it shouldn't be there. I, I knew it had to come out. But I sort of doggedly kept it in until the last possible moment, and then I yanked it. Um, so you, it's easy to end up with a lot of stuff like that. So I, I listened to Reem D and I, I didn't read it, so maybe you can tell me, how, how long is it? How big is the book? It's like a thousand pages. And, and when you, what, what did you turn in? I mean, was it a lot more than that or was it? No, no, it's not, um, uh, that's not how it works. Uh, the, um, um, you know, if, if, if you turn in something that's way bigger than they're expecting or that's way bigger than the, than the actual book that gets published, it means that something's gone horribly wrong uh, up, upstream. So um, editing things in the sense of, of whacking out huge pieces of material is just not a, a, a thing that, that one wants to do because uh, it's kind of like doing surgery on an organism, you know. It, uh, uh, it, it, it leaves scar tissue. It introduces bugs, basically, from a from a maybe a more black hatty kind of perspective. It's interesting um, analogy. You, you, yeah, you, you you can't you can't go in and change one thing without introducing a bug in some far flung part of the the, the manuscript that, that only comes to light when when the book has been published and somebody notices it and sends uh, and sends email to me. 
<laughs> so uh, I, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about your, this, this Kickstarter project that you just uh, completed called Clang. Mm -hmm. And uh, you raised over half a million dollars for this effort to figure out a way to make sword play more realistic in video games. Where did the impetus for this project come from? Well, I've been doing, you know, I've been interested in some sword fighting my whole life. Uh, I've been sort of doing it as a recreational pursuit for about 10 years. Uh, and um, uh, I, don't, I don't claim to be an, an expert on it, but I, I have seen enough to know that um, the, the, uh, what we're seeing in video games doesn't bear any resemblance at all to how it works. And I think that's interesting because I mean, if the answer were nobody wants that level of technical detail in a game, then I'd be happy with that answer. But if you look at the way shooters work, the level of technical detail in shooters has become out of control. I mean, you can customize your, your rifle and your scope and your stock and everything else, and the, the physics of the, the bullets are <coughs> carefully simulated, you know. Um, and... Uh, um, I can still remember the first shooter I, I played when this, the, the game actually kept track of how many rounds I had left in my magazine. And, and being kind of offended by that, because I was used to having the playing games where you just had an infinite Unlimited, yeah. Yeah, amount of ammunition. And my, my first reaction was, well, I don't want to worry about that. You know, I just want to hold the trigger down forever. Uh, <laughs> But after a while, I, I started to see that, well, okay, you know, I can handle this. It's not that hard. And it, it makes, you know, I'm, in a way, it's the game makers showing a little bit of respect for me by, by you know, adding this additional level of, of challenge. So it seems like if people are happy to accept a higher level of realism and complexity in the way projectile fighting is depicted in games that they they might be ready to do something analogous to that with sword fighting and the um, the information is definitely out there uh, there's been a, a big movement in the sort of western martial arts or historical european martial arts during the last decade or two that has brought a huge amount of uh, of information to light on old sword fighting techniques. So um, uh, all that is just sitting out there w ready to be embodied uh, in, in a game and, and the, the purpose of Clang is to, 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 to do a, a sort of, I would say, a, a, a demo or a pilot project of, uh, of one such system uh, and, and make it work in a game environment. So you've, what's next? You gotta hire a bunch of people or? Yeah, yeah, so we're we're hiring uh, a small crew. Um, half a million doesn't go uh, a hell of a long way uh, in the in the game world, so it, it'll be a, a pretty a ragtag uh, effort <coughs> uh, for a while. But, but yeah, yeah. Uh, is this your first Black Hat? Yeah. Have you been to DEF CON before? No. No. Well, welcome. Uh, one of the things I was blown away by. <laughs> No pun intended. Uh, when I when I first got to uh, DEF CON and Black Hat was uh, how many people I found out owned firearms, uh, and and and, for, and that kind of surprised me. It, 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 but then I started thinking about it. I was like, you know, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, these people are about security. They're about personal security. If somebody steps to them, if you rob some geek's house, you gotta be you're gonna be in trouble. Are you are you into uh, firearms? Sort of. I mean, uh, you know, I, I own a, a, a few, and I, I guess I'm kind of interested in 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 it. I'm not. Uh, I'm not like super. I, I don't geek out on it uh, the way I do on swords for some reason. Uh, so I'm. I'm. I guess in the middle ground of. of I don't hate them or want them to go away, but um, uh, actually. Um, Using them seems like an inordinately expensive way to make holes in pieces of paper. Uh, so, Fair enough. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm picturing an armory at the Stevenson household. I mean, you, you got a bunch of swords, I guess, though, right? Yeah, I've got a bunch of swords, most, most of which are, are not actually in my, my house. Um, but, um, I mean, uh, yeah, there's... Uh, 
Uh, I, I've got some, uh, a couple of, of, sort of reproduction Japanese style. They're all reproductions. I don't have any actual old historical uh, weapons. Um, and then a lot of them are training. They're blunt, specifically made for, uh, for training uh, and, and sparring purposes. And then, uh, and then a, a couple of, of sharps, uh, long swords mostly. Respectable. So I, I saw on the Clang Kickstarter page that said you were recently at, at a conference called Combat Con. Yeah. I'm picturing lots of... Yeah, it was here. There. It was right down the street at the Tuscany. Yeah. Um, Can you tell us a little about what goes yeah, on? Yeah. I mentioned before that there's been a big movement in the last decade or decade and a half to revive these uh, old, mostly European uh, fighting styles. and. Um, and so there, there are workshops that happen uh, all over the world uh, devoted to that, and, um, and for very good reasons, most of them have been pretty serious and focused uh, uh, on sort of a kind of interesting combination of very serious academic scholarship and physical activity, right? So it's people who can read incredibly obscure ancient dialects of Italian or German and translate these old manuscripts and then run around and smack each other. Uh, and and um, the, uh, the idea with, with Combat Con is to sort of have one of those running in parallel with more of a, uh, a fanish kind of convention, a, a comic con kind of uh, vibe with, uh, with uh, costumes and, uh, and, and some uh, you know, uh, sort of media-based ac activities, learn how to do, you know, Jedi lightsaber fighting, because it turns out that there actually is a, a system for that. Um, and, uh, and sort of uh, explore the more fantasy, kind of fun-based uh, angle. Yeah. So I, I totally uh, stole this next question from a, a Slashdot thread that I read gosh, almost like a decade ago now, but uh, I didn't see you answer it in your Slashdot interview, and I'm really curious about the answer. Uh, the question was classic era science fiction, so Heinlein, Asimov, mm -hmm. uh, was notably more humanistic and positivistic in tone. And in works from that era, the future was bright, the challenges were overcome by clever individuals, and technology and science led humanity towards ever greater accomplishments. But now it seems like science fiction tends to paint a much bleaker picture of the future, and maybe to some extent the, the present. Do you agree with that? And why do you think that? Yeah, I mean, you've, you've totally nailed a kind of hot button uh, issue with me. So I'm like, I should preface this by saying I'm exhibit A of the dystopian, gloomy uh, cyberpunk uh, uh, science fiction writer, and that's kind of what I've spent my whole career doing. Um, but um, uh, we had an interesting conversation uh, about a year and a half ago at a Future Tense conference in D.C. Uh, where this, this topic came up. And, and the, the, sort of, uh, the, the gist of it is that during the, the time that science fiction has become what you just described, uh, there's been a, a uh, marked slowing down of, of technological development, leaving out the, the, the sort of digital and biotech world. I realize that's a large thing to leave out. Um, but, but if you look at our built environment, the way it looked uh, at the beginning of the 20th century and the way it looked uh, two-thirds of the way through the 20th century, you know, during that time we got radio, television, airplanes, computers, nuclear power, uh, many, many other radical changes. And since then, um, everything kind of looks the same. You know, the cars look different, but they're still cars. Um, and they're not flying. They're not flying. Um, the, the, the space program tanked, um, and uh, a lot of stuff just didn't uh, happen the way we were expecting. So but this leads to the kind of interesting question, uh, is there, a, a causal relationship between the darkening and the, the sort of dystopian uh, trend in science fiction and uh, the, the fact that our future isn't developing now the way that it, it did during the golden age of, of science fiction. And if there is a causal connection, which direction does the causal arrow point? 
Um, and um, so uh, I think there's, uh, I mean, it's, uh, there's plenty of room for debate about this, but um, I think there's some legitimate reasons to think that it points from science fiction into the, the, the world of technology. Um, in other words, that uh, if all of our depictions of the, uh, of the, the future are incredibly depressing, then it doesn't give us a hell of a lot of incentive to go out and build the future. Uh, it kind of gives us uh, an incentive to do the opposite. And so uh, I ended up hanging out at this, at this uh, conference with Michael Crow, who's the president of, uh, of uh, Arizona State University, who uh, uh, memorably uh, started giving me and, and uh, the rest of the science fiction community a hard time for slacking off. You know, he says, we've got all these uh, engineers and scientists and people who want to get going <clears throat> and go out and build cool stuff and you science fiction writers are screwing around with, uh, you know, people wearing mirror shades and, and like hacking into stuff. So get off your ass and start writing some, some fun ideas. Um, so we've we've uh, created or we're working on uh, an anthology uh, called Hieroglyph that is uh, is going to do exactly that. And um, uh, my <coughs> contribution to that is is going to be a story about a building a 20 kilometer high tower. Um, and uh, I've been working with uh, a structural engineering professor at Arizona State on trying to figure out <coughs> what that might look like. Uh, it's actually a pretty hard and interesting uh, problem. Um, and um, uh, there's uh, Arizona State's working on creating or has created a, a new entity there called the Center for Science and the Imagination, which uh, is going to sort of be a sibling entity to uh, the hieroglyph uh, anthology project and um, and foster more of these collaborations between the science fiction writers and uh, actual scientists, engineers, students who might be able to um, uh, explore some of these ideas and kind of get them booted up. Well, so some of your work, predict, uh, particularly Anathem, did I pronounce that right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, has been called speculative fiction and I'm wondering just to follow up on what you were saying about, you know, authors having slacked off, um, to what extent do you think technology is originating, uh, is executing original concepts that were first thought of by hard fiction, hard science fiction authors, or is the opposite true, that science fiction more extrapolates looking yeah. at existing technology? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's important to kind of tread carefully here be, because it would be really easy to, uh, to give too much credit to science fiction writers, since I am one. We wouldn't want to do that. So, um, but uh, the, the observation I've made based on feedback I get from actual engineers uh, and scientists is that um, there is a particular way in which science fiction can be useful, which is that it gives people a sort of template uh, or a shared picture that they can uh, aim at. So the situation that tends to arise in big organizations is that you've got a lot of engineers all trying to build one big thing and they sort of are somewhat cubicle bound and, and focused on narrow aspects of the, the problem and in order to coordinate their work and make sure everybody's doing the same thing, you have to have a lot of meetings. And so there's a lot of this uh, sitting in meetings, staring at PowerPoint presentations that are meant to keep everybody on the same track. And um, uh, that, uh, that might not be the most efficient and certainly not the most entertaining way to keep everybody pulling together. Uh, whereas um, if you've got a sort of compelling depiction of the end product in a work of fiction or whatever, then everyone kind of knows what they're doing in some sense. Um, so uh, um, so that, that's, that's actually like a, a somewhat plausible way in which science fiction might have utility beyond just simply entertaining nerds. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Um, so uh, Jeff mentioned this, uh, the, your work, your part-time advisor to Blue Origin, 
uh, and you've lamented the, the demise of the, the space program. Uh, so Blue Origin is an entity working to develop crude, as in people, uh, <laughs> suborbital launching system. Who, who exactly, what exactly do you do for them, and, and what are your visions um, for them? Yeah, I, I, I was there uh, at, so at the beginning uh, through about 06, and, uh, and, and then um, I've, I've had only the most distant in <clears throat> involvement with it since, largely because um, they, they sort of uh, decided what they wanted to do uh, and started doing it, and it became a more of an engineering uh, uh, organization uh, where um, well, there wasn't that much for, for me to do, frankly. So um, the uh, uh, so I just decided I would sort of uh, back away and let them get busy uh, building this thing. Um, so, but until then, I was looking at uh, various um, possible alternative uh, launch schemes, of which there are many. So what, what uh, hope do you have for this, the private-run space program? Well, it's, uh, uh, if you look at what SpaceX has done recently, it's, uh, uh, I, I, I'm not sure if, if people who haven't actually worked on rockets can really understand what an impressive thing those people did because <laughs> it's really hard, you know. I mean, it's just shockingly difficult to uh, to to make rockets uh, that that can survive. That even to make one that just w can run a static test on a stand for a few seconds is an incredible challenge. But to make one that's uh, capable of flight uh, and surviving everything that uh, a launch vehicle has to survive. Uh, is is unbelievable. So that's you know a very optimistic sign. Um, uh, but the, um, uh, the 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 difficulties are tend to be in in places that are are not so obvious. Uh, things like uh, getting insurance for your payload is uh, turns out to be a, a big issue if you're creating a new. The launch vehicle or, or an entirely new category of, of, of launch system, you've got no track record, it's hard to ensure this very expensive uh, payload that you're going to send up and you know that, that can, uh, can be a big obstacle to getting anything done, getting approval uh, to launch uh, uh, from an unconventional site is really hard because you've got to have uh, You've got to do a big study of every conceivable thing that could go wrong and where stuff might hit the ground, um, depending on different failure scenarios. And so everyone sort of downrange of you kind of has a say in that. Uh, you, 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 so you end up having to use existing facilities and that locks you in, in a certain sense, to a certain set of procedures and technologies. It's, you know, it's a big, hairy complicated thing and, and, and uh, there's a lot of non-obvious challenges, I would say. No. So some of your books seem like they would pretty easily convert to movies. Is that, is that in the cards at all? Um, most of them are, are too long. Uh, a, a short story is a, a better candidate, really, for a movie conversion than, uh, than most novels. And um, from... Uh, and obviously, I tend to write big, big, fat novels. So, the um, uh, we've talked for for uh, for years and years about uh, about doing something with Snow Crash. It's an obvious candidate for a, a you know screen adaptation. And uh, I've been working with the the Kennedy Marshall Company for a long time on on that. Um, and it's gone through different phases and. And so on. The the most recent sort of bit of news on that front is that uh, uh, they've announced that, that Joe Cornish, who's uh, an English uh, writer and director, uh, is is going to take the lead on this this project. So I've met with Joe uh, down at Kennedy Marshall's offices, and we've you know talked about uh, the direction he's going to take with it. Joe. Uh, has done uh, a really cool uh, science fiction movie called Attack the Block, which uh, got a lot of attention. Uh, hack the hack the block. Attack. Oh, attack the block. The, the block. It's it's uh, 
aliens land for some reason in a slum housing project in East London. And, and, and uh, so the, the, the people who live there uh, have to, uh, to, to fight them. It's a good, it's a good, it's a fun movie. Uh, so it's got a lot of the same energy uh, that you might look for in Snow Crash adaptation. And I'm sure that's why uh, Kennedy Marshall uh, were, uh, looked at, you know, decided to, to get Joe involved. So some of your books, I think, have aged pretty well, um, at least the ones sitting on my bookshelf. Uh, this is, is this a concern of you when you're writing? Uh, to, to, for, you know, do you ask yourself how a book is going to be perceived yeah. in 10 or 20 years? Yeah, well, yeah, it's, um, I mean, the, the, the best kind of future proofing is to have good characters, try to tell a good story, uh, because those things don't age. Um, the, um, I have become somewhat conscious. Uh, it, it, in Ream D, for example, um, uh, in, in earlier drafts, when people were using their phones or whatever, I would call out, I would say, you know, iPhone or, or, uh, or Blackberry or whatever. And, um, um, and then, you know, a, a, a friend who read it for me pointed out that um, those might be good current references, but in even a few years, um, it's going to make the whole thing seem right. dated. So I, I ended up going through and changing every single one of those to phone. For, first, I changed it to f uh, cell phone or mobile phone. And then I, I realized even that is ridiculously dated because... Uh, no one uses landlines, so I just made made them all into phones, um, and um, so that that was an incident of uh, in incidents of uh, of kind of future proofing and and trying to keep it current. Um, there was another one that uh, I was thinking of that escaped me, but um, anyway, yeah. well, we can come back to that if you want. Um, so the Blackhead folks put together. Uh, a LinkedIn page and encourage people to submit questions. We got a few of them. Uh, one, this one comes from Tim S. He says, uh, how can security researchers and practitioners develop their own skills in envisioning the future when designing systems? Well, um, I guess uh, fiction writing is maybe a useful exercise in that it it forces the writer to envision not just a specific technological widget, but sort of how that would be integrated into uh, something that works economically and socially. Uh, so, uh, and, and maybe that's why science fiction you know, can be a useful tool for a technologist. So, um, uh, to, to think about um, sort of I mean, there's there's a kind of of, uh, of science fiction writing that happens anyway when people develop business cases for a new technology, right? I mean, you, you can you can imagine a you know you, you, you can imagine something that would work technically, uh, but to justify to get funds for it or whatever, you sort of have to be able to tell a kind of story about how it would be used and how it would make money. Now, it's not. In most cases, it's not anybody's idea of you know, spellbinding literature, but um, but it's it's a kind of proto science fiction writing, and um, and y you can kind of build on that to think about uh, okay, why would this be cool? You know, why would people want to use it? How would it affect their lives, uh, and so on and so forth? And and that um, again might not hit the bestseller list, but. But it's it's an exercise that's kind of science fictional in nature um, that uh, that might help people uh, shape the the way that they develop new stuff. Who would you say are some of your most influential authors, and I'm, maybe some who aren't as well known as some of the ones we've discussed? Well, the, yeah, the influence question is a, is a hard one to uh, to, to answer. Um, because uh, it's 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 non-obvious in a lot of ways. I mean, I, I read a lot of the, the golden age uh, science fiction authors when I was a kid. Obviously, uh, for whatever reason, the one whose work has stuck in my head the most is Heinlein. So I can remember very specific moments or images from Heinlein novels. Um, 
that have stuck with me uh, and that I can kind of describe to you right now um, in a way that wasn't true of, of some of the others. Uh, so, um, um, so that's kind of a curious fact about how literature works on the, on the brain, I guess. And then um, the, uh, for a long time I kind of didn't read a lot of science fiction, but um, uh, in the in the sort of 80s, I would say I, you know, I, I read uh, William Gibson's uh, work and, and uh, Pynchon and, and uh, a little bit later, uh, uh, David Foster Wallace and, and was struck by the, this idea that, that people were writing stuff that was arguably science fiction, but, but that you know, had literary qualities. Um, and uh, not that the old stuff didn't, didn't but um, but you know William Gibson in particular and Pynchon were were you know, generating material that was uh, you know really had kind of sort of academically respectable literary credentials, uh, but that was also good SF. So that was a big influence on me, I think. So you're a pretty keen observer of details, which is probably a big part of what uh, attracts this the audience uh, and the geek audience to your book. But because uh, I think it's that level of exactitude, and and I'm. It's kind of fascinated by how people not only learn but retain knowledge, and I'm curious if you have any special ways for storing the, uh, your thoughts and, and w mm. when you're doing your research or traveling or anything like that. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, for me, I think it tends to be visual. Uh, I can't remember people's names, for example, until I've seen them on a name tag or you know, written down somehow. Um, so. Uh, um, I think that narrative seems to be a really valuable, um, I'm hardly the first person to point this out, but if you can tell a story about something, uh, it helps to organize it and keep important details uh, in memory. Um, so maybe there's a connection between that and what I do uh, for a living. Um, but I don't know, I've always just, um, I've always said that uh, some people have a mind like a steel trap, and I have a mind like a lint trap. <laughs> I just, you know, I just retain all kinds of, of, of stuff uh, for, for no particular reason. Uh, as a world-renowned author, I'm sure you get uh, your share of, of, of crazy groupies, um, and, and that you place a pretty high value on your privacy, but do you take any special care uh, measures to protect your privacy online? Um, and how concerned are you about this? Yeah, I just, uh, I, 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 I did for a while, you know, I it was kind of in on the first wave of, of GPG and, and trying to and, encrypt all of my email and it, it uh, just didn't, didn't work. Uh, I mean, it worked. It worked great on a technical level, but it didn't work socially. Nobody was, was, was using the stuff and if they were using it, they weren't using it right. Um, and um, um, I just uh, sort of came to realize as time went on that, that, that uh, if, if there was going to be a, an attack of that type, it wasn't going to come through uh, like breaking my, my key. Uh, it was going to happen through, you know, a, a keystroke logger or, you know, a microphone or or something like that, that is, uh, for which there's, there's not a, a really clear digital uh, countermeasure. Um, so I just uh, got pretty relaxed about it and, and I guess kind of fatalistic. Um, I, I don't, what I do for a living, you know, I have a lot of information that, that I, I prefer that it not get out too soon, but um, I, I'm not dealing with secrets in the way that people in the national, national security uh, world have to deal with secrets or, or the way that a, a big uh, corporate executive has to keep certain secrets. And so um, um, I just, uh, uh, I've just tried to, to, to think a little bit before sending emails, I guess, because uh, I know they're all going to get out someday. You ever seen that plug-in where it makes you wait? Uh, 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 20 minutes until you can actually send the email? There's actually at uh, uh, 
at, 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 at CAA, there's actually a, uh, a department, uh, the, 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 the talent agency in, in LA, that, that uh, helps people with that. But if, if you're a movie star or a sports hero, and you've got a Twitter or a Facebook, uh, they'll, they'll kind of uh, insert a buffer. <laughs> Well, you, you mentioned national security. Uh, you live in Seattle now with your family, yeah. is that right? Yeah. But I read on your wiki page that you grew up in uh, the backyard of the uh, National Security Agency there in Fort didn't, Meade. Yeah, I didn't grow up there. I was born there. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like an interesting factoid. It's, I don't think I know anybody that who's from Fort Meade. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's actually not that significant. But, but my dad was in the Signal Corps, uh, and um, you know, he's an antenna guy. Um, so, um, uh, in true uh, Fort Meade style, he's never really said much about what he did there, but, uh, but he, he was an antenna guy. So, probably something to do with that. And uh, we moved away when I was, uh, was, was pretty young. Um, and, um, um, and I never really thought about it because the, the very existence of the NSA wasn't really public. Um, uh, until I got older, but um, but we drove out there once on a family trip when I was a teenager. Uh, so it was just we're we're going to drive up and down the East Coast, you know, and visit places that we used to live. So so we went to this. I was expecting a, a an army base, you know, <clears throat> with some tents or something. I don't know some Quonset huts, but you know, <laughs> suddenly we're looking at these you know, gigantic buildings. Uh, which to me seemed really non-army-like, and um, yeah, I found it incredibly mysterious, uh, and didn't really understand until the uh, the Puzzle Palace got got published uh, a few years later. The cryptos? Is that what you mean? Uh, uh, That's the CIA, isn't it? Yeah. No. Yeah. So we've got a, a couple minutes left. I just want to ask you. So this will probably be the last question. But um, in in Reemdi, uh, there was another area where I thought I saw you sort of injecting yourself a little bit into the story. And the main character, uh, Richard Forthrast, is this sort of recovering dope smuggler or something. And uh, he's, he's got these furious muses that, uh, to me, it, I guess they're supposed to represent former girlfriends or something, but they're always editing his every move and thought. And, uh, do, do, you, do you have any? Do I have furious you? muses? Uh, it, it used to more, more than, than now. It was sort of a... Uh, I mean, it's a classic. Uh, it's a classic psychological, uh, you know, profile to uh, to to hear negative voices in your head. You know, not in the sense that that psychotic people do, but just you know, to to, to imagine the way uh, uh, your your mom or whatever would would be criticizing you if she, if she knew what you were doing right now, and so. Um, uh, in his case, uh, I just gave him a really, really bad <coughs> case of that particular uh, syndrome, um, and um, and it's it's double-edged, right? He he calls them. He's sort of interested in Greek mythology, so he knows that there were the Furies and there were the Muses, and the Furies are kind of angry and furious and bad, and the, the Muses are sort of. Uh, Beautiful and wonderful, and make you better and inspire you. And these these are both these these serve both roles for him simultaneously. So you got it under control, then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that's about all the time we've got, folks. Uh, please join me and give me a round of applause for Neil here. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Uh, Neil's going to be Thanks. signing uh, copies of his book in the Palace Ballroom One uh, just after this. So thank you guys again for your time. Thanks. Thanks, man. Nice job. Yeah, thank thanks. you.